Hello, I'm delighted to be asked to give this keynote presentation for the conference. I've chosen to focus on an aspect of a project that we ran with a museum and draw out both the experiments from a research perspective and also those which were part of the experiential learning process. So the focus will be on building a Bronze Age boat, but there were many underlying aspects to that. First, a little bit about my appreciation of the role of practical experiences and the way in which they can add to experimental work. I have always found that learning new crafts, engaging with practical experiments, adds insights to the sorts of information that we can draw out of the existing archaeological record, as well as testing further the ideas we have about it. I've worked with a variety of different craftspeople, with many open air museums, and I've worked on a variety of different subjects too. What I want to do now is just draw out a little bit about those before turning to the Bronze Age boat project. One of my key research interests is what I've called the missing majority. All of the perishable material culture which finds itself surviving so rarely and which often comes to us in a really deteriorated fragmentary state. This can be amongst the most challenging material to present effectively to the public. And yet at one time, it was the majority of all material culture as it is even today. That is one of the reasons why I have become very interested in how we interpret the past and present it to the public. That too can be a source for experimentation. It's always interesting to see where one gets the original ideas from and how people start off in a particular direction in their research. So I thought I would just explain that I actually undertook my first experiments using an archaeological open air museum as a lab to help myself when I was doing my PhD. That was in Sheffield and the museum I worked with was Butzer Ancient Farm and I interacted with Peter Reynolds who gave me some great ideas. One of the reasons for this was he grew crops in a prehistorically relevant way. Often if you want to make experiments you're relying on trying to get the raw materials, make the tools, conduct the technologies, perhaps also understand something of the use of materials, the use and performance of those tools. And so one experimental program to look at, for example, function becomes an increasing challenge as it diversifies into all of these different directions that is so typical of experimental archeology. span But going down to Butzer and being able to use my tools on relevant material, simple crops, harvested, in a traditional way and having been grown in a traditional way and weeded using traditional tools. Those were all helpful in my original idea for that experiment. In these ways, archaeological open air museums are indeed the laboratories for many other people to go and interact with them and conduct research projects as part of a mosaic of opportunities. I also think that experimental archaeology and practical experiences can really benefit how the museum presents itself to the public. It can explain that we don't always know the answers, that we are actively seeking them out and that engaging in the process of research can be very attractive to the open air museum visitors. It's also really helpful for research students, master's students and undergraduates to undertake project work with museums or in relation to other aspects of learning skills of communication. 
that's one of the reasons why I set up in 2000, 20 years ago now, the MA in Experimental Archaeology. It's now an MSc in Experimental Archaeology and we're celebrating its 20th birthday. Within that time frame, so many students have undertaken projects and benefited with interactions with open air museums. There's far too many to mention, but it's a rich and very diverse experience. And we've worked with a number of museums um, in Europe and beyond. It's also worth mentioning another project where we built boats and we interacted with open air museums. Um, this was a multi-stranded project known as Open Art, funded by the European Union Cultural Programme. And many of those results are on the web and freely available to download. As part of that project, we ran some workshops and a conference, and we then drew on those authors and their contributions to put together this edited volume on the life cycle of structures in experimental archaeology. Because each one of those has something of a life cycle and you can break it down into different phases. We didn't just look at houses, we looked also at storage structures, at pits, at technological structures, and in one chapter, at boats as structures. This reported some of the work that we'd already done with the Bronze Age boat project, but also much smaller, more ephemeral craft using very simple technologies. These are all available to read for free at Leiden Sidestone Press, where you can find this publication. So now I want to talk about the Bronze Age boat in context from the archaeology. We know that there is seafaring in the Bronze Age, not least because of those wonderful Bronze Age rock carvings from Scandinavia. We know a little bit about the form of them from that iconography, but a lot more is understood from the archaeological remains themselves. Here I've just presented a map just to remind us all of the trade and exchange between the continent and the islands of Britain and Ireland. And to point out to you the Humber estuary where the archaeological evidence from Ferriby was found and also the location of Falmouth in the southwest, which is about two hours drive from Exeter. And that is where we engaged with the museum for the project that I'm going to speak about today. The archaeological evidence comes from the Humber Estuary at a site called Ferriby, where there are three separate boat fragments, some of which are very substantial indeed, as you can see. The timbers are massive and they are carved from single large chunks of timber. The joints are stitched with yew withes, that's flexible pieces of branch which are turned and then used to hold the material, and the caulking in the seams is from moss. They're a very distinctive form of boat, sewn plank boats, and it's this that we wanted to try and replicate. Sewn plank boats are known from other places around the British Isles. So they all have slightly different dates and they are arranged on this slide in date order. Note that the Dover boat, which is another famous find from the UK, is about 500 years younger than the Ferriby boats that we were replicating. Nonetheless, there is an established style of boat that can be attested from all of these sites. We knew when we started this project that there would be experiments within experiments and that it would get complicated. It did very fast. 
But it was also one of the joys of working with such a large scale project in front of the public. So from an archaeological perspective, the idea was to build a full scale replica as close as we could get it to test construction methods. And then if it was successful to design the performance and test out a real boat and its performance on the water. Morgawa, which is the name the boat was given, is the name of a sea serpent, which there's a legend about in Falmouth where we were making the boat. So the boat obviously had to be called Morgawa. The other very obvious point when we went into the project was that we would be experimenting with the tools. So making and using the bronze tools to do the tasks, sometimes on unfamiliar materials and processes, but often on familiar in broad terms processes, but not with those particular kinds of tools. The tools would then form part of a useware reference collection. The other aspect of working in front of the project gave two further elements, the construction as performance and the inverted exhibition. To take the construction as performance first, building the boat inside a museum as part of an exhibition was an experiment in public presentation. It's almost like live action role play, but with a finished end product. And because it was going to take many months to complete the boat, what became the problem at the start was simply showing the public what was going on, because at the start it did not look like a boat. And I've got some images of that to show later on. The second element was really significant for the museum. The museum relies on public income, public pay to come in. So the concept of the inverted exhibition to turn on its head what normally happens with a new exhibition. So for the most part, a museum constructs an exhibition and then there is a blaze of publicity and the museum's public relations department then try and generate more news stories as visitor interest slightly tails off. Instead, performing the construction in, part, in public reach turned this on its head and gave us the inverted exhibition where every element could grow publicity and knowledge about the exhibition as the boat came to life. This really was the birth of the object biography approach to structures and the reason why I chose to put that book together. Because of my own interests, I was particularly interested in the experiments with plant materials because some of these were known traditions in broad terms, but unfamiliar in the exact plant that was used. There was another experiment which was using volunteer labour, attracting and keeping volunteers to run the project seven days a week for months on end was in the end a challenge but one which we relied ultimately on the shipwright to oversee and to engage and to keep the volunteer labour coming. The specific plan was to build a boat inside the museum, construction as performance, to obtain as much information on the tools, techniques, any changes in the design features from what was originally agreed by a panel of experts, what changed and why, to create the exhibition around the build so that there was an explanation of the Bronze Age and the context of shipbuilding as part of the explanation to the public of what was going on in front of them. There were also a number of events planned. There were themed children's activities, public lectures by members of the project, and obviously, and at that stage, hopefully, a launch in the water of a successful vessel that floated. This was a new venture for the museum and for the University of Exeter, which led the project under Robert von Vandenort. We obviously wanted to build a boat that was a real boat. So if at some point there needed to be changes made to the design, we all agreed that that would need to happen. We wanted a finished boat. As a part of that, the tools were there, 
but their performance, the hafting, the sharpening, sometimes had to compromise a little bit to get the boat built. Tools as extensions of the body can be very personal and skill levels can really affect the wear processes and the breakage rates. We found all of that out. Unfamiliar materials had to be researched and operational sequences devised for them to get them to the stage where they could contribute and match what we saw from the archaeological finds. The materials were sometimes species specific versus generic to a particular kind of technology. There was seasonality about when some of the things could be achieved and there were variations in the processing and operational sequences, some of which were caused by actually doing the build inside a modern centrally heated building. But there were also, as with any large project in the modern era, there were deadlines, budget constraints, and we had to balance off these different elements of the project. So the spin-off projects and ideas had to, in the end, be compromised a little to meet the primary objective, which was a functioning boat. Construction as performance and building within a museum for a major research project does bring its own challenges. But as I explained, it was also part of the purpose behind this um, project as a whole, and also one of the reasons why the project was funded as it was. The National Maritime Museum Cornwall has a building that sits right on the waterfront. So you can see from the boats, there's a building behind it with a tall lighthouse-like tower. That is the National Maritime Museum. It hosted this major exhibition, 2012 BC, Cornwall and the Sea in the Bronze Age. And as a part of this, in the bottom left, you can see the boat under construction in the museum workshop in full view of the public with a wicker fence separating off the workshop space with a series of panels and explanatory texts around setting in context seafaring and the Bronze Age so that visitors to the museum were fully informed about the context for what was happening in the workshop. In the construction as performance, the museum used a variety of social media, YouTube channels. There was time-lapse photography of the build with a series of YouTube composite features put together. And I love the fact that as well as all of that modern technology, they were also using a blackboard to update the public on the latest information. As with any other museum exhibition, it was useful to collect visitor comments and feedback. And it's interesting to see the style of the comments and the fact that some visitors specifically said that they returned to the museum several times to follow the progress of the project. So the act in front of them and the construction as performance showed from the visitor comments to be a very successful idea. It was also one where, although people were in broad terms familiar with carpentry, the exact style of this new way of making a boat really drew people in. And it was the unknown element and the research potential that was also part of that fascination and draw for the visitor. I always feel slightly weird talking about this project because it's usually just me presenting it, but there were so many others involved. The research team put together drew on academic expertise from the University of Exeter, Southampton, Oxford Brooks. We obviously work closely with people at the National Maritime Museum itself. And of course, Brian Cumby, the shipwright, had a tremendous influence on the project as a whole and its successful completion. So this is just a tribute to all of those involved. Tom Monrad Hansen was one of the master's students at Exeter who worked with the project as it happened and was so taken with it that he stayed on to work with Brian and follow it through to completion, becoming Brian's number two hand to oversee the project as a whole.
One of the interesting aspects about making this kind of boat is how many people with boat building expertise do you need? And the project was designed to have one experienced shipwright. Choosing that shipwright was crucial to the success of the project. Many of the volunteers brought their own skill sets, but these were incredibly varied. The youngest person was 16 and the oldest was in their 80s. They had all kinds of backgrounds. One idea was that as people joined the project, they would be set the task of making a paddle as a way to train them and to give them a broad introduction to working wood with hand tools. This is Brian Cumby, the shipwright, just holding up one of those paddles. One of the nice aspects of working with the volunteers was the diaspora of different ages and backgrounds who were drawn to work with the project. That was something that everybody drew attention to when I collected feedback on why they'd come to the project and why they had stayed. These were key questions for us because the museum was looking to have this project as a pioneer of a style of work which they wanted to carry on doing for other projects in the future. People came because they had relevant skills or because they wanted to learn them. Some of our own experimental archaeology students undertook projects and dissertation work, but many other kinds of students also took part in the project. We knew that the tools would be a crucial element of the project, but there were still some surprises along the way. The Bronze Age tools were all made by Neil Burridge, an expert bronze smith. One problem was that we had to commission them and start the project with a very short lead in time and we needed 30 of these. So we hafted these pieces as axes, adzes and chisels and made some compromises on the style of the hafts in order to simply get the project going. There was a baseline recording of all of the tools which were individually numbered. They were then used by all of the volunteers, so many hands used the tools with very different levels of experience. This did lead to quite a lot of damage and the need to repair and resharpen quite frequently. Overall, this is the set of tools that was still in existence and performing fairly well um, at the end of the project. More had been turned into chisels because there was more need for that as the boat project progressed. And there had been a lot of discussion about the length of handles with the shipwright expressing a very clear preference for long handled adzes um, as a way of saving wear and tear on his back, which obviously we had to take into account. So quite a few compromises needed to be made to accommodate the style of work and its context in the museum with inexperienced people and with modern expectations of health and safety work. One of the problems was that that kind of timber is incredibly expensive because it's so rare and you buy it after seeing it in the lumber yard but at that point you cannot return it. So it has to do the job you want it for because you can't afford to buy more materials of that nature. Splitting these using traditional techniques with wedges was at one point thought to be the way forward. But as you can see, this tree had quite a twist in the grain and in the end, some compromises were made and some of it had to be machine chainsawed in order to make sure that the resource was used effectively to get the job done. You withies sounded very straightforward, but they became part of 
a very interesting and challenging element within the project. The archaeological pieces clearly showed that these withies were small in diameter and had been twisted in the same way as one would do for willow withies made to bend sharply as part of a handle. This was an example of where the basic technology was fairly well understood, but for a different species. And the willow technologies do have slightly different challenges compared to the U ones. The U is much thicker and tougher to use, which is advantageous for its purpose in building the stitches for the big planks, but led to some problems because one needed to maintain the flexibility and the grip of the material in order to thread it through several times the holes that had been created for the stitches. So the behaviour when it was being stitched and the preparation needed to get to that behaviour was an important part of the challenge. Various kinds of yew tree were looked at to try and source these young one or two year old branches. And there was quite a lot of help given by arboretum and cuttings that they had made originally. But what we found was that you needed the yew to be very fresh indeed. And so in the end, a churchyard not far from Falmouth was used as the source for all of the yew withies. Once they had been prepared and twisted to encourage them to flex, this is the kind of tight, round, circular flexibility that they could exhibit. And that is why they are so useful for these stitches. The moss caulking was another element of the project. The archaeological record showed that most were loosely constructed and put in loose, and those were mostly from woodland species. There were, on occasion, cordage made from hair moss, and sometimes that was placed in the seam. The example shown is from Ferriby 3. The hair moss forming the plied rope was made as a replica and was tried out. And this certainly was effective, but so was the woodland moss just loosely pushed in. A lot depended upon the size of the gaps that were being filled. Here, a yew withy is shown as stitching through the hole it needs to be pulled a little bit tighter, but underneath the batten that covers the seam between the two planks, there is more of the moss caulking mixed in with tallow animal fat. The side view shows this process more clearly. These are two of the plank elements with the caulking between them and with a slight lip created to seat this plank on top of this one. And then the whole is bound together and held rigid using this batten and the stitching material over the top. Taken all together, the stitching elements of the boat were a major component. There were 225 U-withies, which means that there was 450 stitch holes and finding the right branches, keeping them fresh, getting the stitch tight, um, was integral to making the boat work as a whole. 500 years later, the Dover boat also has you with is, but the planks are much thinner, and there are also more varied bronze woodworking tools available, according to the archeological evidence that we have. The next series of slides just give something of the flavour of the boat as it took shape. So the example on the right here 
shows the squared up timber and people using the Bronze Age tools as adzes to finish off that process and to try and then carve out the curvature. None of this was sprung into shape, it had to be carved into shape. At times in the summer when the weather was fine, there may be only one or two visitors, one or two volunteers working on the project. Debarking, squaring up the timbers took a very long time. And as the project progressed, we realized that some compromises would have to be made and that some modern tools would be needed to speed up the processes. Some of the timber was able to be removed using traditional techniques. For example, here, a chunk of wood is coming off as a plank section. Once the broad shape of the timber had been made, then the cleats and the other features of it had to be gradually etched out using chisels and using adzes, a very slow process. The rocker or rounded shape for the hull had to be carved out in the same way. Photographic records, laser scanning at intervals and time-lapse photography were all conducted. I went down regularly and looked at the progress overall, but also how the tools were performing. Robert Vandenort was checking the progress weekly, if not more often, and a number of the academic staff involved in the project also put in days working on the project using the Bronze Age tools. The time-lapse photography was really useful as a way of explaining what was going on and putting out adverts on social media of what the project was achieving and progress to date. The next set of slides just explain a little bit more about how the visual layout was very important. Because we weren't working off a plan, nor were we working to the model, instead these visual layouts were the key way to progress the boat and to make any changes in the design. This explains a major stage where the boat was mocked up visually using, in our case, some battens and some hardboard cutouts to just visually check how the lines of the boat were going to look. This visualization could easily have been achieved by string and by pegs in the past, and it certainly helped make some of the key design decisions based on how the boat shape would move through the water. Anyone who worked with the project became familiar with Brian's first rule of shipbuilding, if it looks right, it's right. And here is an example of Brian and one of the volunteers just checking lines. This was done all the time. The central plank and the two side planks are making progress. An example here of a day when there were several volunteers in, all working on these details of how the cleats and how some of the features of the boat would be worked into shape. The frames all had to be individually cut using timber that had come from trees. So all of these shapes make use of branches in timber. As the final days in the museum build were approaching, more and more of the shape and scale of the boat became apparent. The difficulties were then going to be how to move it out of its indoor workshop environment to the place of the launch. The final boat was drawn by Lucy Blue and colleagues from Southampton University, and the drawings are shown here. 
the boat was just slightly asymmetrical and one side was also slightly thicker and heavier. A drone was used to capture the boat from an aerial perspective, um, which showed that broadly speaking, it looked and behaved in a very symmetrical way. The boat was raised up onto a trolley, wheeled carefully out of the museum workshop where it had been built, and it's at this point that the scale of it really started to show, as you can see here, as it moves along the museum building. This is the finished boat as it was left on the slipway to be launched the following day. One of the things I realised when building the boat is that ownership may be really a very complicated issue because the person who initiates the boat may not be the person who ends up owning it and where so many people have taken part in the build it may indeed be in some form a communal boat and of all of the volunteers myself included who helped physically build that boat every one of us could have pointed to marks on the timbers or bits of the boat that we made. Ownership and the communal labour are very interesting processes. The launch day itself was an incredibly eventful day. As the tide crept in, so we had cameras from the national news looking at how the boat was going to perform. Brian had always been very clear as a shipwright that the first time you put the boat in the water, it will leak. And indeed it did. Here you can see Tom bailing out some of the water, but I thought it was fun because there's actually a Bronze Age example of a baler in the National Museum of Scotland. So they bailed in the Bronze Age as well. And as the boat swelled in the water, so over the coming days, it actually took in less water. But yes, the boat let in water. The cameras on the quay recorded the success. Everybody was getting ready to get into the boat. But the thrill of actually being in the boat and paddling it on that first voyage was an incredible experience. And you can see here the scale of the boat and the numbers of people in it. Every one of those people had earned their place in the boat and many more. There was a camera mounted on the person in the prow recording the experience, as well as lots of the international news teams. It made the six o'clock news in Britain, which was quite something for an archaeological reconstruction project. The length of the boat and how it rode the water were one of the things that we wanted to look at in terms of its performance. Other aspects of the performance were how easy it was to steer. As you can see, the team of paddlers was not quite in sync, but that boat was then taken out by a rowing crew. And we did record some of those experiences and they were put up on the Internet. So my final slide. This was most definitely an overarching research experiment, but it also contained many sub experiments. It was also a fantastic set of experiences which led into different insights into all of those different sub experiments. If you want to find out more, the publication in the academic journal International Journal of Nautical Archaeology is available to download for free. I hope you've enjoyed this talk and it's a memory of a really special research project. Thank you. Bye.